My name is Willie Bolin. I study influence, persuasion, and leadership in selling and sales management, and I teach people how to sell. In this podcast, we'll talk to some of the world's top sales leaders and see what we can learn from them. Welcome to the Sales Lab. This episode is brought to you by Rainmakers. But here's the thing, it's not the word Rainmakers. It's the word Rainmakers with no vowels. R-N-M-K-R-S, Rainmakers. How will artificial intelligence change the future of sales? Will it help us do more, replace us? Join Rainmakers Virtual Sales Competition to see AI in action, helping thousands of students get massive role play practice and feedback on a bias-free level playing field, and it's free. To join the movement, go to rainmakers.org. Again, that's R-N-M-K-R-S, Rainmakers with no vowels, dot org. All right. One thing that all good podcasts have when they first launch is kind of an episode zero that explains what they're doing, why they're doing it. So this is my attempt at an episode zero. I don't have a guest. It's just going to be me. Sorry. So let's address a few questions. First, why the podcast? And I think like most people who put their name on some sort of broad-based offering like this and put it out to the public and expect them to listen, uh, I guess the short, somewhat snarky answer is because I'm a narcissist. But uh, I think and I hope I'm a humble narcissist, right? So I want to put this information out there, but I don't necessarily want you to just hear my opinion, right? The the podcast is not supposed to be about me. I want to tap into the wisdom of others. I want to talk to sales leaders. I'll define a sales leader as someone who demonstrates excellence either in their personal sales performance or who leads a team or an organization that demonstrates excellence in sales performance. That's kind of a broad interpretation of that. But I want to sit down and have conversations with the type of people that I want to learn from. And then when they share their wisdom I want to make sure that anybody else who's interested in in learning from them can hear it as well. So that's the idea in putting these interviews out. Um, Another thought on why the podcast uh, comes down to positioning. So in the sales lab, we want to focus on information and knowledge, not motivation, not just getting people excited. Uh, There's two reasons for this. One, you'll learn that I'm a bit cynical and I don't really care much about motivation. I'd I'd rather not talk about it. And I, I don't really like the idea of what I might call selling hype, right? I don't, I don't want to just overpromise and underdeliver, right? I don't want to get you excited and then not tell you how to do something, right? Uh, a, a lot of uh, what I talk with with Val McCausland in episode one, when we're kind of teasing with the idea of crushing it, is around this idea. Well, yeah, sure, there's nothing wrong with crushing it. You should go out and crush it. But how do you go out and crush it? I don't want you to get excited about doing something that you're not equipped to do, right? We want to talk about actionable ways to increase your sales performance. We want to challenge assumptions. We want to have kind of a thoughtful, intelligent discussion about the sales profession. I'll leave you to motivate yourself. The second big reason is if you look at all the podcasts out there, all the different sales related offerings in the podcast world, there's actually a lot of other people that are talking about motivation and they do a really good job of it. So I'm well aware, despite my narcissism, well aware that I'm not going to do a better job than Zig Ziglar and the Ziglar podcast and, and, and the people that now run his company at talking about motivation. It's just not going to happen. So where I feel like there is a gap and where we can add value is by having serious, thoughtful discussions about the sales profession. So that's what we're trying to do. The next question might be a little bit about my background. You know, you don't know me. Where did I come from? Why am I talking to these people? So let me start from the beginning. I grew up in North Florida, small town, right next to a military base. And I don't know if everybody that grew up in this town shares this perception, but my perception growing up, and I know it's at least shared by some of the people I was close with, was that, you know, if you had a parent who was an engineer that worked in, you know, civil service contracting with the military, then your vision for your future was very likely to be an engineer working with the military. If you had a family that was just, you know, in in military service, then you just kind of assumed that you would go into military service. And then that left a lot of uncertainty for the rest of us who just happened to live in the area surrounded by these military bases. And, you know, we had people that were good at skateboarding and we had good people that were good at guitar. And for a lot of us, we didn't really see options beyond that. So, At the age of 18, I turned 18 and I'd been working for several years at a fast food restaurant, was the maintenance man at the time. And I turned 18 and I thought, well, I'm 18 now. I need to go find a 
grown-up job. And of course, the place you would find a grown-up job at the time was in the classified section of the newspaper. So I opened up the newspaper and started going through and I, I had an orange highlighter and I was circling different job positions, different ads that seemed like maybe they would be a good fit for me. And the things that I was, I was circling were things that were all manual labor, all blue collar. It was a cabinetry uh, apprentice. It was a deck and seawall building assistant, right? North Florida stuff, all blue collar, all manual labor. And, and then I came across one ad and I remember exactly what it said because it you know was really a sort of pivotal turning point in my life. It said, make eight to sixty dollars an hour doing easy work. And I mentioned earlier that I'm a bit cynical. So my my take on this ad was that it was probably some sort of scam, some sort of weird thing, but I am interested in weird things. So I figured I'm, I'm going to call it and find out what this is all about. So I called, got the voicemail and left them a message and simply said, hey, uh, my name's Willie Bolander. I saw your ad in the paper. I'm very interested in making eight to $60 an hour doing easy work. I think this is something I'm going to be really cut out for. Hung up, didn't know if I'd ever hear anything, kind of left a smart aleck message, but it was fun. Got a call a couple hours later, a gentleman named Tony Ryan, my first my first boss in the professional world. Hi, Tony. Says, hey, I really like your, your voice. Your, your voicemail was funny. We're looking for people to cold call consumers in the middle of dinner. Your call list will be a phone book and we want you to interrupt their dinner. He didn't say that, but you know, we want you to call during the evening hours and try to set meetings with these people so we can go sell them insurance and financial products. And all I heard was, we'll pay you $8 an hour to sit here and get hung up on all night long. And of course, you know, if they said if they sold anything, if they set an appointment, and then if they sold anything, I could get bonuses on that that could add up to more. But again, all I heard was, $8 $8 an hour to get hung up on. That was more than what I was getting paid being a maintenance man at a fast food restaurant. And it seemed like much easier work. Uh, so the ad was the ad was presumably right about that. And I, I said, yeah, I, I've got I've got no pride tied up in this. I, it, nobody's going to hurt my feelings by hanging up on me. Uh, I said, yeah, I'm definitely interested. Let's, let's do it. I said, well, when can you start? And I said, I can come first thing tomorrow morning. I was trying to be a show him that I was a go-getter. And Tony Ryan said, well, why not right now? It was about two or three in the afternoon. I kind of laughed and said, okay, that's fine. I can come right now. Gave me the address. And I said, well, uh, you know, one last question. What does somebody wear to a job like this? Was there a dress code? They said, oh yeah, no, it's, it's, it's easy. Just, you know, normal stuff, uh, some khakis, a polo shirt, something like that. I said, okay, great. Hung up the phone and immediately thought, damn it, I don't own either of those two clothing items in any form or fashion. So I ran to a used clothing store and picked up one pair of khakis and one shirt. I didn't really know how to match the colors either, so I bought a shirt that I thought matched because it was also a khaki brown color. And I showed up to this job looking more or less like a, I don't know, UPS man, you know, wearing all brown from head to toe, basically. And got on the phone, they gave me a script, and I went through the script that night, and as expected, got hung up on over and over and over again. Didn't hurt my feelings. And we were gonna stop calling at nine that night. When I say we, I was the only one calling. The, The other guys were, you know, in their office is doing whatever they do. And I was going to stop calling at nine. And at 8.55, somebody answered, went through the script again, and got to the uh, got to the point where I would ask, you know, does, does that sound like anything you'd be interested in? And, and you know, w- we could sit down and walk through some of these things with you. And the person, I, I wish I could remember her name. It was a very, it was a woman. It was a very unique name. And I, I wish I could remember who it was. But she said at the end of this spiel that I'd been told no all night long using, she said, yeah, I, I would be interested in getting some more information on that. And at no point had it entered my brain that somebody might actually say yes to meeting with us. I just assumed that I was going to get hung up on indefinitely until these people got tired of paying me to get hung up on and then they'd let me go. So I was shocked. And this ended up being a rather, you know, major paradigm shift for me, realizing that I could wake up in the morning and engage in activities that would set something in motion that would create things that hadn't existed before, right? Relationships, transactions, sales, you know, whatever, you know, somewhat of a entrepreneurial sort of mindset as well, right? That you can, you can create something by your actions that didn't exist before you set out to make it exist. You can enact your environment. And, and these things had never really been obvious to me. As a kid, I played music and we would start projects and bands and we would write songs. And I understood creation from that standpoint. I understand. I understood that you could create a band and create a song, but I didn't understand that that same sort of way of thinking, that those same principles could be used to be a businessman, to sell something, 
to create wealth. To me, business was what old, boring people did. It was the the two older gentlemen in the movie, if you recall, uh, Trading Places, right, with uh, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. And these two old men who sit around and toy with people and spend their money and look at their stock ticker. And um, that was what a businessman was in my mind. And then I started realizing, well, oops, you know, while I was playing music, I thought I was just screwing around. It turns out I was working. I was selling. I was building relationships, right? We would build relationships with club owners to book concerts. We would build relationships with musicians in other towns to trade shows with them, right? This is all sales. This is all relationship development. Uh, And I had no idea. I thought we were just horsing around and having fun. It turns out I had actually been accidentally working the whole time, working pretty hard the whole time, you know, nights, weekends, you name it. And uh, it was shocking to me to realize that, you know, you had a lot of flexibility in the direction that you take your life if you make the choices to take it in a specific direction. So that job and really, and that first night of that job was, as I mentioned, kind of a major paradigm shift for me, realizing that I had options, realizing that I had opportunities that maybe I hadn't considered. And so I worked at that company, uh, worked for Tony for a a few years, ended up getting licensed to sell life insurance and annuities. Some weeks went very, very well. Some weeks went incredibly poorly. Remember in in one specific month, I had in one week the highest paycheck of anybody in the office, including the boss, and uh, felt like the king of the world. And I know this is, I now know this is very common in sales, right? That you, you have these dramatic shifts of feeling like, the, you know, you were completely cut out to do this job and you're untouchable and unstoppable. And then for the following two weeks, not just having the lowest paycheck, but having no pay, paycheck, literally making zero dollars those following weeks. And of course, if you combine the highest paycheck for one week with zero dollars the following weeks, that starts to balance out to a pretty mundane average weekly paycheck. You know, the guy I worked for, I've already mentioned his name, Tony, great guy. I learned a lot from him. The company I worked for, I'll not mention their name because I think the company, once you got past Tony, the company seemed to not have their act together as much as would have benefited a young starting sales professional, right? So when it came to training, it was watch what I do and then you go do it, which is not a terrible way of training, but it's not very effective. It it can be vastly improved. You know, they might say things like, well, ask questions and find out if the prospect needs to buy uh, what you're selling. So, okay, great. Well, that's still pretty broad. What types of questions, you know, what what, what do you mean by ask, you know, ask how their day's going? I ask if they like football. I don't know. What do you, what do you want me to ask? And it took me a little while, you know, kind of without a structured, rigid training program to start to figure these things out. And in fact, it wasn't until I moved to Atlanta initially to do an another music project with some people that I knew uh, living in Atlanta, Georgia. And I started selling accounting services, uh, which is a great job. Hi, Stanley. Thanks for letting me sell accounting services for you. And ended up going back to school. At that point, I was a a college dropout uh, two times over, you know, because school's for suckers, you know, you know, the old saying. And then I got to Atlanta and realized, you know, people really, whereas in North Florida, a college degree, at least in my town, didn't necessarily buy you a lot of additional opportunity? Well, in Atlanta, it really did. And I went on all sorts of interviews before I uh, started selling accounting services uh, with people who'd say, yeah, we we like your experience. We like you. We we like your, the way you position yourself and, you you know, we like everything about you, but HR has this little box that we have to check that says you have a college degree and you don't, so we can't hire you. And I remember the the, the first time I heard that thinking, you know, what a, what a backwards way of looking at the world, you know, what, what, what kind of crazy people care about having a college degree like that matters, you know? And I remember specifically the thought entered my mind, you know, what, what kind of a rock did these people crawl out from where they think a college degree is important? And then I heard it again from another company. And then I heard it from, you know, I forget how many companies, several more companies, you know, 10, 20, I don't know. But uh, enough companies told me the same thing. Yeah, we, we, in order for us to hire you, you would need a college degree that it, it became apparent to me somewhat embarrassingly, it wasn't them that crawled out from under the rock. It was me that crawled out from under the rock. In my little hometown, the college degree didn't matter. But in the broader world, this was an important thing that I needed to get. So then uh, one of the accountants I worked for said, have you looked at Kennesaw State University? And I told this accountant, Eddie, that I didn't know what words he was saying. I'd never heard of that place. I'd never, I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, no, it's just, it's just north of Marietta, just, no, just northwest of town. You should take a look at it. And I pulled up their website, Coles College of Business, and the very first thing that I saw was that you could get a bachelor's degree with a focus on 
sales. And I had never seen that before. I was quite intrigued. And that's exactly what I ended up doing, going there because I felt like I still hadn't gotten sufficient sales training. And I thought, well, maybe this is a place where I can go to, to really learn more about what I'm doing. And again, it's not that I was doing things that were bad. It's that I was doing some things that were good and some some things that were ineffective, but I would have no way of differentiating between the things that were good and effective and those things that were not. And I wanted a system. I wanted a method. I wanted a step one, do this. Step two, do that. I wanted a ask this type of question. And then depending on the response, try to ask the following type of question. And I was never really able to get that when when I was working. And what my hope was by going to Kennesaw State and doing the sales program that I would be able to get that type of information. And that's exactly what happened. So it was at Kennesaw State that I learned about spin selling and was able to start applying spin questions to my sales calls for the accounting firm. And I'll tell you the, the first, and I was a little annoyed because I'd been selling for what, four or five years at that point before I had heard about spin questions. And so I wrote out example spin questions after we after we learned about it in, in our professional selling class. And I went and got on the phone later that day to have a meeting with a gentleman named Mark who owned a business in the Discovery Mills Mall up in Atlanta. And I called Mark and I clumsily read through my list of spin questions. Tell me about how you are currently handling your accounting services. What are some challenges with the way you are currently handling your accounting services? Tell me more about that. How often does that happen? How does that make you feel? Does that cost you in terms of time, in terms of money? And then of course the, uh, the everybody's favorite, if I can show you a way that our accounting services can help you alleviate those pain points, would that be something you'd be interested in hearing more about? And again, very clumsily, there was no, it was not poetic. It was not smooth. I just read the questions to this guy named Mark. And at the end of it, Mark said, yeah, I I would like to hear more about that. And we set a meeting to kind of go visit him and actually, you know, do a a more detailed product demonstration and, and continued the conversation with him in person. And I got off the phone and was filled with so much excitement, you know, that, oh my God, this is exactly what I've been missing. This is exactly what I've needed, right? I've always had the willingness. And maybe this is why I don't like the idea of, of motivation without direction, because I was always willing. You know, you, you want me to work hard. You want me to work on weekends. You want me to work long hours. I'll do it. But give me some direction. Tell me what to do. Tell me how to be successful when I'm investing this time. And so that was another big sort of pivotal pivotal moment, uh, I guess, was learning about these sort of different methods. And I've learned an awful lot about additional methods and, and more specific ways to apply questions and what to do when questions aren't working. And we can talk about all that at another time. But that really got the ball rolling and realizing, wow, there is a systematic, some some might say scientific, but I, I think that word is kind of overused. So I'll just say a systematic process-driven way of approaching these things. And by the way, anytime you're asked to do something that's kind of ambiguous, the the way you approach that situation is with a process, with a system. You take your car into the auto shop. They don't just start taking wild guesses about what's wrong with it, right? They're going to say, okay, you're, you're coming to us with an ambiguous problem. Your car is making a noise. Your car is, you know, acting kind of jumpy. It's not running smooth. And we're not going to just assume what it is. We're going to we're going to apply a process. We're going to plug in the computer. We're going to run a diagnostic. We might take it for a test drive to narrow down the possibilities and, and the things we want to look at. And that's exactly what I learned about selling, that when you're asked to do something ambiguous, and I would say selling is very ambiguous, how do I get somebody to go along with my request? How do I get somebody to want what I have to offer? Well, you apply a system. And the system doesn't have to be perfect, by the way, but it's a starting point. It's a uh, roadmap, an initial roadmap that you're going to use to begin conversations with people who might have problems and needs that you can solve with whatever you're selling. 